Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Rancho Mirage City Council for December 5th. City Council will also be acting as the Library Board, the Housing Board, and representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. So I'd like to begin with the flag salute led by Councilwoman Iris Smotrich. Iris? Thank you, Iris. On uh, November 26th, I had the pleasure of attending a ceremony at the uh, Hyatt in Indian Wells, which was honoring uh, all our public service uh, police and fire representatives. And at that time, uh, we presented two proclamations to uh, individuals that served the city of Rancho Mirage. The first one was a proclamation to fire apparatus engineer Robert Snow who, with the city of Rancho Mirage Firefighter of the Year. And the second one was Chris, Deputy Kristen Rogers, uh, Riverside County Sheriff and Rancho Mirage Officer of the Year. So if Kristen and Robert could come forward. Thank you. If you just come up here and we'll... Okay, right in here. That's this way the camera can catch your good side. Okay, that's good. Okay, the city of Rancho Mirage nominated apparatus chair, uh, engineer Robert Snow for his years, Rancho Mirage Firefighter of the Year. Engineer Snow is assigned to Fire Station 50 Rancho Mirage's number one station. Engineer Snow was chosen because of his dedication to firefighting profession by his actively monitoring members of the department's volunteer reserve fire fighter program. And I have the proclamation, which we presented just a few weeks ago, back on the 26th. And this uh, is uh, for Robert Snow, Rancho Mirage, Firefighter of the Year. Congratulations. I'd like to thank the, the mayor and the city council. I have the wonderful opportunity of working here in Rancho Mirage uh, for the last few years. I've uh, been in the valley for quite a few years in different cities, and I'll have to say Rancho Mirage has been my favorite. It, uh, it's very nice to work here. Very, very nice people, nice community, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We <laughs> City of Rancho Mirage appreciates everything you've done for us, too. Kristen, would you like to come over here? And uh, the other presentation went to Deputy Kristen Rogers. She was nominated by the City of Rancho Mirage as the Rancho Mirage Officer of the Year. Deputy Rogers was selected for her DUI enforcement position uh, that was created due to the high number of DUI-related traffic collisions in the Cove communities. Deputy Rogers performs her duties in an exemplary manner and holds to the highest standards of service to the department and the city of Rancho Mirage. So congratulations, and the proclamation, again, designates you as Police Officer of the Year. I'd just like to say thank you to you, sir, and the rest of the City Council, and of course, um, my Lieutenant and Captain at the Palm Desert Station. I've been with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department a little over three years. Uh, total uh, law enforcement experience is almost eight. I really appreciate it. Um, Impaired driving is something I hold dear to my heart, and I'm privileged to uh, be able to serve in the city of Rancho Mirage and keep your uh, streets safe. Thank you very much. Okay. 
the, one of the reasons that Rancho Mirage is such a great place to, place to live is that we have great public servants as, uh, as Robert and Kristen are. So uh, we appreciate both of the jobs that you guys do and, and all the other officers who are here today to support you. So thanks for being here today. Okay, our next presentation is uh, a presentation to members of Eisenhower Medical Center, and that's going to be done by Mayor Pro Tem, Iris Mottridge. Thank Iris. you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just a few words before I come down in front to, to greet our wonderful volunteers. Um, I have mentioned many, many times how important we all feel that the volunteerism task force is to all of our cities. Uh, I think volunteers are very under-recognized and under-appreciated. Uh, they are there when so many other people are not available. And uh, we value every hour that they put in, and uh, we're so thrilled to have so many of them in our city of Rancho Mirage. So I will meet down in front uh, with some volunteers from Eisenhower Hospital, Margot Baxley, Edward Coleman, Jean Richards, Barbara White, Cynthia Williams, and just keep in mind that these are the people in our communities that volunteer for our hospitals, but we also have so many that volunteer at our learning institutions, our museums, our synagogues, our churches, and our charities, and uh, we all appreciate their being to here today. Thank you. Well, hello, hello, and thank you again for being with us, and uh, I know some of you would like to say a few words, so I hope you'll feel free to uh, let us in on uh, your volunteer life and your life here in Rancho Mirage, and uh, whoever wants to start first would be terrific. Thank you. Um, I'd first like to uh, give the apology for our uh, director for volunteer services at Eisenhower Medical Center. Uh, Rhiannon Howell, she is away at a seminar the full day and she would otherwise be here. She is our staff leader and the person who should be here. Um, I would rather finish up with a word at the end. Margo, go ahead. Hi, my name is Margo Baxley. Um, I volunteer at the emergency department at Eisenhower, which is a wonderful place to be. If you, you think we're underappreciated, no, they're they're very kind and very appreciative of what we do, and they, they make us feel very welcome. They work long, long hours there, and anything that we can do to make their day a little easier and um, just communicate with patients that have long waits sometimes, it's a pleasure to be there. Hi, my name's Ed Coleman, and I've been with Eisenhower about almost 15 years now. and. Uh, I'm a case of what now? I've retired at a comparatively young age of 58 after having worked since I was 13 in my dad's grocery store and uh, found the need to get away from the high stress I was under and everything else. And then what now? So I was way too energetic to sit at home and watch as the world turns or whatever's on that television during the day. And I had been, our family's been very fortunate in that uh, we had our children. We've been married for 53 years, my wife and I. We've had our children, grandchildren, now great-grandchildren, and everybody healthy, and we all get along very well, so it was time for me to pay back, and paying back is what I've done with the volunteerism. And uh, once again, I'll also say the same thing. We are showing appreciation on many occasions. We don't do it for that reason. We actually get more out of it than we put into it. Uh, with me as cardiovascular, I do a lot of walking around the hospital, up and down stairs, and I get to do all kinds of challenges that keep my brain actively uh, improving itself even as I age. <clears throat> but anyway, I didn't want to blab on all day, but thank you for honoring us, and it's our pleasure to be of service to you all. Thank you. Barbara is one of our chaplain's assistants. Barbara? 
I'm Barbara White, and I represent the chaplaincy team. Hospitals are full of emotion. There's fear, there's panic, there's hope, there's joy, and there's despair. Our team is there to shore up anyone who's in need of faith and there to help make some very, very difficult decisions, not only with patients, but with families who have to make the decisions. And so our team is terribly blessed that we have the opportunity to be of help in such serious matters. And it is our joy, truly, to be on deck and available whenever needed. Hi, I'm Cynthia Williams, and I volunteer at the Lucy Kersey Cancer Center and the Infusion Center, and also closer. Okay, thank you. Is that better? All right. I volunteer at the Infusion Center at the Lucy Kersey Cancer Center, and I also volunteer at Collector's Corner. Um, if you haven't been to Collector's Corner, you should go and visit. It, it supports the Eisenhower Hospital. Um, all of our merchandise are donations. I love volunteering there. A lot of people come in and it's their department store. And I really enjoy helping the customers pick out outfits, uh, find things. It's, it's just a joy. And I also, at the Infusion Center, it's a little different because we have people coming in that are going to be there for many hours. And so I help them get comfortable, talk with them, bring them water, blankets, pillows, anything to make our patients more comfortable. And I'm very blessed that I feel that I can do this, so thank you. I'm Gene Richards, and I'm a uh, auxiliary uh, board vice president for volunteer services. Um, and I just want to sum up what th these volunteers and 800 others that we currently have active at Eisenhower uh, give to the hospital. Um, this year, our vol our, they will volunteer a total of over 120,000 hours which at about $23 an hour, which is what the national uh, group has set the dollar value of a uh, volunteer hour at a hospital, uh, that means about two and a half million dollars to the hospital this year that these people have given in their time. Um, and that means a lot. What means more is that Probably next month, the middle of January, the total number of hours donated to Eisenhower will exceed 5 million hours in the 40 years, 42 years that the hospital has been opened. So that, I think, is a pretty wonderful thing. If you think about it a minute, what they are giving is the time of their lives. There's only much, so much time in a person's life, so when they give their time, it's irreplaceable. Anything else you give, and be replaced, not that. Thank you. Thank you all so much, and uh, very impressive. Needless to say, two and a half million dollars uh, is a substantial amount in a year that can be saved to the, for these institutions, and we are so thankful for the work you do. So. Uh, we'd like to present you with a certificate of our appreciation from the city of Rancho Mirage uh, for your volunteer service at the hospital. We would also like to give you a little bit of sweets to sweeten your day. And I, I don't know if you like sweets or not, but I picked out and packaged up myself um, a, a little variety of candies and it will be something that you can munch on the way back or uh, put on your desk and enjoy when you have time. Anyway, thank you again and thank you so much for coming and joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you You're welcome.
Thank you, Iris. Because of the uh, earlier morning meeting where we call roll, I neglected to call roll for this meeting. So just to bring us back to where we should be, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Hines is absent. Council Member Hobart? Here. Council Member Smotrich? Mayor Pro Tem Smotrich, pardon me. Council Member Weil? Here. And Mayor Kite? Here, and thank you. And uh, would you please uh, note that uh, Councilman Hines should be excused that he's on city business. Yes. Can I have a second on that, please? Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Please vote. Well, it's a unanimous vote. It doesn't want to come up for okay, me. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item uh, today is a presentation by John Hicks from the Ritz Carlton. John, are you here? Okay, John's not here, so uh, we'll catch up with him when he gets here. Uh, the next presentation is by Frank Taylor of the Community uh, Safety Consulting Group regarding a conceptual program for unmanned aerial systems. Frank, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I think I have a PowerPoint. There you go. There you go. Uh, Mayor and uh, members of the council, thanks for having me back. Mr. City Manager, the same. Um, uh, my name is Frank Taylor, and I'm retired from the Sheriff's Department as a captain back in the summer of 12. I started a company called Community Safety Consulting Group, and the majority of, of my the members of our group ha are volunteering our time locally uh, to increase safety within our communities because most of us live here in the Valley and have done so for a long time. Uh, uh, we're presenting this uh, conceptual program as a... Um, to help educate uh, not only the council but the public as a whole and there's no funding being requested um, th this is a pretty good time if you saw um, 60 minutes on Sunday night there was a discussion about uh, Amazon th uh, thinking conceptually about delivering packages in the future so I'll give you a little bit of education regarding this and I know you've been working on some items regarding an ordinance recently I'm two up one more Okay, uh, what we're trying to do is provide information on the vi viability of an unmanned aerial system program to supplement, uh, supplement search and rescue, to increase disaster preparedness, and also to educate uh, officials so they can weigh in on the pro uh, a program, local ordinances, and also the 2015 integration of unmanned systems into the national airspace. Uh, here's a list of several public uh, agencies and civic groups we've uh, presented to the sheriff, uh, most of the police chiefs in the valley, uh, CVAG, uh, Public Safety Commission, and uh, several city councils so far. Just to give you briefly an idea what an unmanned uh, aerial system is, it includes the small unmanned aerial vehicle itself, uh, currently about less than 25 pounds per the FAA. It allows for semi-autonomous flight, uh, uses GPS and waypoints to be able to, to move through the air. It has automatic uh, return and landing that's required by the FAA for these systems to be able to be uh, uh, certified to fly. It uses electro-optic uh, and infrared cameras. And a big thing that is kind of a misnomer, they're controlled by a two-person team. There's human beings that are controlling them at all times. There's a pilot in charge who operates the system, and then also a sensor observer who uh, uh, handles the sensor or camera system that's attached to it. Um, it, it's noteworthy to know that an unmanned aer aerial vehicle is just a flying camera operated by a person. It's not, there's nothing new that's being used. Uh, the helicopters have been used for decades. Cameras have been used on the ground in the air in the past. Data has been retained. There are photos, video, dash cameras, automated license plate readers. Public agencies already follow all laws into place, and citizens' rights and privacy has always been a top priority of public agencies. In recent history, in February 12, the uh, FAA Modernization and Reform Act was uh, signed by the president. It allows uh, certificates of authorization to public agencies to operate systems. Uh, 
and also it sets a, date, a deadline for September 30th of 2015 to implement a plan for unmanned systems uh, to go into the national airspace. And then also in February of 2013, uh, California Assembly Bills 1327 and SB 15 were brought into play, and um, I'll, I'll touch on the, uh, SB 15 in a second. Uh, there's a view of one of the systems we're talking about. It looks like a small airplane and uh, usually comes in a package of three vehicles with a ground control station attached to it. Okay. Um, we're prom promoting, promoting an aircraft style unmanned area vehicle system, system not the, the copters that people see normally. It's similar to a, a conventional air, uh, helicopter or an aircraft. The public is used to seeing helicopters circle around in, in their areas. So this is kind of the same system. That's exactly what it does. It circles. It, it goes from a, a height of about 200 uh, feet up to 10,000 feet. But currently, uh, per FAA, they can only go as high as 400 feet. They have rapid deployment. They're less susceptible wet to weather and there's less privacy and search issues uh, attached to them. Some cost savings we have I've identified for using there is currently it runs about $700 an hour operational cost to run a helicopter where an unmanned aerial vehicle runs about th uh, $30 an hour. That's not including the personnel. Um, specifically trained volunteers or non-sworn can be used instead of sworns. Um, they can handle about 30% of the work at about 2% of the costs attached to them. That still leaves about 70% of the regular work to, to, be, to be done by conventional means, um, but they can be a cost savings for the future. On the hovering style her, um, aircraft, we, we've identified they have more privacy and search issues when you think about them being over your home, in your backyard, or looking through your window. Uh, they have limited range, about 40 minutes. It's closer to 20 minutes because of the battery and the weight attached to them, and they're pretty a lot more susceptible to weather issues. Oh, you can go past that one. Thank you. Um, on the FAA rules, they require all the pilots and sensor observers to have passed aircraft ground school and also to pass the private pilot's written exam before they can be certified to fly. They also have to go through a process of, with the manufacturers of the device, learning them so they're certified. And all of them have to have a class two airman certificate. Okay. Um, they're all current. The FAA requires them to be less than 25 pounds right now. They have to be flown in line of sight of the pilot, maximum 400 feet above ground level. Uh, when you think about the mountains next to Ranch Mirage and everything, if something were to fly up the side of the mountain, as long as they stay 400 feet above the slope, that's, that's within the, the limits that per the FAA, so they're able to be used in search and rescue. Um, they're not to be flown at night um, or within five... Uh, miles of an airport, there's an exemption if one of the pilots is a commercial pilot, which means they can fly, a pilot can fly for pay. Uh, this, the authorization from the FAA is only being given to public agencies, universities, and manufacturers for development right now. There's no commercial or business use authorized by the FAA right now. And a penalty for any of that is up to uh, $10,000 maximum for violating that. The conceptual plan that uh, we've been pushing to, to different uh, groups is to add some elements of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the um, uh, another group for transparency, uh, privacy, search, and civil liberties, community engagement in the beginning. Uh, no weapons attached to any of them, making sure that all missions are publicized so the public can see them all, um, making sure that all images taken from them are available for public inspection and they th should be deleted in a reasonable period of time unless they're sealed by some way of a court order. On the retention of data, uh, we've been pushing a, a program to make sure the concept would focus on making sure all, doc all flights are documented. Uh, by GPS coordinates, where the device is, what the camera is pointing at at any given period of time, how the data is retained, and making sure all the data is available for public viewing. Some past positive things that I've been pushing across to all the groups that we've, we've been presenting to. Mesa County Sheriff's Department in Colorado, they started a program in 2009. They had a lot of community outreach. All, all their information is available for public viewing, and they have a no secrets attitude towards, that, um, to, towards their program. In June of 13, um, up in Canada, they used a device to, to locate a man that was involved in a traffic accident and walked away from his vehicle into the forest. Um, they were able to find him by way of infrared and save him before hypothermia came into play. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen on TV recently the Yosemite fire at the Rim Fire. They used a, a UAV to be able to see through the smoke and at night and continue operations to reduce the time on that fire. 
Moreno Valley has a citywide uh, program for a video program, which has been a positive uh, program that has a lot of uh, community outreach at the beginning. And then also you're uh, looking at uh, and being forthcoming, for moving forward on an ordinance here in Rancho Mirage. Regarding SB 15, um, uh, that's the bill that's pretty, the, pretty far into the legislature right now. They thought it was maybe going to be um, signed before the end of the session. Um, they're going to take it up again here currently in the spring. Um, it's not overly restrictive regarding uh, the use of the systems as long as the public agency is reasonable. Regarding eavesdropping surveillance of privacy laws that public safety is already required to follow and could be held civilly liable if they violate those, part of it is to apply those to private persons, which means that a person right now can sue somebody if somebody looks in your backyard or through your window with a high-powered telescope, um, they can also be sued. Uh, you can use the same process to sue them if somebody use a, a unmanned vehicle with a camera attached to it. Also in SB 15, which they combine with AB 1327, the, all the images should be destroyed within a year unless they're pursuant to a court order. Any acquisition of a device by a public agency should be done by the uh, legislative body of that. And it doesn't preclude any city uh, or other local public agency from adopting a li uh, additional provisions that can be more restrictive in regard to the uses of them. Part of the thing regarding private model aircraft and UAVs uh, that you've touched on um, in the past is after a SB 15 or local ordinances are put into place, there's going to be an impact upon public safety. When when people see these these, these things in the in the future, or if they're integrated into the airspace, uh, they're going to call 911 and ask for somebody to check into it. Um, then the the officers are going to have to check whether it's a re recreational user, is somebody using it for co commercial businesses, or is it a peeping tom, some guy just using the UAV to look in somebody's backyard. So it's going to impact public safety at some point. The plan we've been putting across is transparency and accountability first, education first, uh, city community businesses, college meetings, focusing upon a fixed wing system and getting a regional acceptance of it. That's why we've gone to all the, to all the city councils throughout the valley. Um, privacy and search at the onset, up front and in public, in, in which including the media, promoting the concept of search and rescue disaster preparedness and public safety emergencies, making sure that people understand that these systems are for saving lives and reducing costs, not to monitor or conduct surveillance in our, commu in our communities. And that's the end of the presentation. I hope I, I helped you a little bit. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions? Frank, we appreciate you coming in. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, go back one item, and we're going to have the uh, status update in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. And John, you got here just in time. John Hicks, re representing the developer of the hotel. Nice to see you, John. Very nice to see you. Thank you for covering for me. I'm actually a little <laughs> bit late, so I apologize. Uh, but at least the news is good as to why I'm late uh, for today's meeting. Uh, I was actually in a meeting where we are officially starting to transition sections of the hotel. Uh, I was going to have some photographs, but I didn't have a chance to process them for you uh, to get them into the display uh, this week. So. I'll have those for you uh, either later in the week so you can share with the staff. Uh, where we're at, uh, officially I can report that we have 105 rooms that have furnishings going into them. That essentially uh, includes all of Wing B, what we refer to as Wing B. That is the guest room wing that is closest to Frank Sinatra as you go driving up the hill. Uh, those have been fully furnished. We have carpet rolled out. All the white stone has been in place, mosaic tile has been in place, our door hardware, uh, which is called safe lock for the entry of the doors has been completed. The only outstanding room that we have along wing B is our presidential suite, which is currently being dressed out uh, with millwork. It has an extensive amount of crown molding, base, uh, custom media niches that are going in. Uh, the boxes have been installed in those and they're wrapping up the crown and uh, some of the finite details of the additional stone that has to go into the presidential suites. Uh, landscape has completed to 80% uh, throughout the pool area. The, uh, that includes irrigation, lighting. The only outstanding lighting that they have, uh, lighting issue that they have within the pool area is some tree rings. 
uh, Monday, we actually start plastering the pools. So our first uh, swimming pool will actually have water in it by Wednesday of next week. Uh, the infinity or reflection pond uh, has been tested. It doesn't leak, thank God. Uh, that will have water the following week. And the children's pool, the spa, will have water in it by uh, the end of next week. And then we'll switch our attentions to the uh, residential, what we refer to as the infinity pool. The infinity pool will be plastered the following week. And now that would conclude basically the pool areas. Uh, the last thing that they would load in there is the uh, turf. Right now we have a small turf line. What is going to be uh, once the hotel opens for next year, where they when they do the tree lining, where they will put the final location for the Christmas tree. We went to a real turf as opposed to a synthetic turf. Uh, we're looking at that going in in a week. And after that, we have some miscellaneous decomposed granite to install, and landscaping in the uh, main pool area will be complete. Fire pits, we've pressurized and tested gas lines. We uh, are one week away from setting the main gas meter for the property, and we're talking about putting the sand and lava rock and actually physically getting logs inside all the fire pits. We have completed the stone within the terrace deck and we have guardrails going in now and being dressed out. Uh, the lobby, uh, if you guys were to come up next week, I invite all the members of council and mayor to come up next week. Uh, our lobby uh, has the honey onyx has been installed. The stonework has been completed in all areas. The special finish, which is a uh, heavy Venetian plaster, three coat process, has been installed and all the stone and wood has been completed inside the lobby itself. Uh, the last thing which they promised to uh, complete by the 20th of December, it's my Christmas present uh, from the landscapers, is we have a cactus garden uh, in the interior. There's a, a small atrium area with a, a skylight over the top just left of the reception desk. That will have a completed cactus garden inside. As we transition to the three meal restaurant, we had all of our uh, mahogany finishes have been uh, installed, except around the uh, chef's, what we refer to as the chef's experience. Uh, that mahogany is coming uh, this afternoon, ready for install, will be completed by next week. The display wine racks will be installed within two weeks. And all of our zebra wood, we have some uh, additional ancillary cabinets that are, uh, have been fabricated out of zebra wood. Those have been dropped, the door faces are in, and uh, countertops should be going in in two weeks, which is called Dragon's Mist. It is a gray and green granite top that will be installed. The display kitchen has all of its glass work complete. Uh, stainless steel is going in. Uh, we have another stainless steel delivery that'll be the, up the hill in a half hour uh, to start dressing out the display kitchen. And the uh, bar, will uh, start dressing out next week. We have some additional refrigeration lines that have to be pulled into the three meal bar. Uh, as I was telling you, the railing, I think uh, for those of you who have uh, toured the site, we have a twisted rail, custom rail that's being installed around the terrace deck. That twisted rail is all in place now. And then they're gonna come back and start the uh, infill pieces. We have 95% of the Pool fence is complete and painted. Uh, they're actually installing the gates and taking care of a couple of transitions uh, throughout the property. The spa suites has probably seen the biggest uh, move towards completion. We have kitchen cabinets installed. All the travertine floors have been installed now. Concrete has been placed in front of the uh, spa themselves and the uh, installers for the stone decks that are coming in front of uh, all the spa suites are going in now. Uh, they anticipate two weeks to complete. Uh, mill work, uh, I think I just already said the mill work within the kitchens are complete within the spa suites themselves. As far as the uh, custom mill work uh, for uh, video displays, vanity tops, bathrooms. They're currently working on that, and by Christmas they will have that completed. 
uh, for the spa suites. And then we focus our attentions on, uh, to the corridors, which has uh, the custom carpeting, uh, is actually sitting in our warehouse right now, ready to be rolled out. Uh, the wall covering has been ordered and is uh, one week out for wall covering going down the corridor of the uh, spa suites. We, uh, thanks to the efforts uh, of uh, our city inspector, we have an electrical meter that sits, and now the spa and spa suites all, all have electric uh, power to them. We have water distribution throughout the entire spa, spa actually throughout the entire property, we have uh, metered water. Uh, the spa, the uh, contractor has completed the lobby floor finish. Uh, the water feature had a custom quartz slab that arrived Wednesday, and they're looking at setting that within the next week. So there's a lot of activity on the uh, spa. All the stone has been completed with inside the spa itself. And we have, uh, I still haven't quite gotten used to them, but some custom alligator skin panels that are gonna be going up. I mean, they're, not, they're a faux alligator skin, but uh, they have an alligator skin look to it. Those will be in in two weeks, and it is a custom leather wall within the lobby that uh, should be finished right around the second week in January. Uh, so I guess what I'm telling the mayor and council, we're on track for our uh, grand opening on March 1st. And uh, I think as some of the inspectors can tell you, if you get a chance to talk to them, there's a lot of things to inspect uh, from a fire side uh, the Riverside County Fire Department and the inspection team will probably be ramping up to about uh, at least three to four inspectors probably to take care of all of the testing that's going to occur. Within two weeks, we start testing our alarm. And our Ritz-Carlton staff has gone from 10 to 15. We're up to, th uh, next week we'll be up to 30 to 35 in staff uh, for the Ritz-Carlton side. And I think that's it. Hey, John, sounds just like a little bit of work left to be done, but a little bit. Uh, you're going to be able to turn it over to the Ritz uh, at the end of this month? We actually, uh, we are turning over the first section of space. It's the uh, administration areas. will be turned over to Ritz-Carlton next week. Great. And uh, they will be looking to move in staff. Uh, I just spoke to uh, the general manager uh, and, uh, earlier today, and by... The first week in February, they will, they already have an executive chef that's on staff. That executive chef will be in doing uh, test menus and training of his staff February 1. Uh, he will be moving in right about the first week in January to set up his kitchen. Okay. And him and the staff will focus on that. Council uh, is available for all testing of meals. That's, I will let you know when they're testing. <laughs> if you happen to drop by, sure. Mr. Mayor, uh, can I ask John a question about yes. a couple of things? Can you talk a little bit about the trail uh, railing that you're working on on the uh, other side of Frank Sinatra? Uh, yeah, uh, you're talking about over by the way where the tennis villas will uh, inevitably be? Yes. Uh, what we're looking at is right now I have my contractor focusing on the completion of spa, spa suites and, and main hotel. They should be wrapped up with the exterior of the hotel within about uh, two to three weeks. And this is just minor patching as they've had to add lights and other things around the property. Uh, I'm gonna have them focus on probably around the middle of January is where I've scheduled them to go over across to the tennis villas. We have an exposed masonry wall. We're gonna have them do a, uh, a two coat uh, plaster finish over the top of the exposed masonry. And then that will be painted uh, I think we settled on uh, the lighter color of the browns. It tends to blend with the desert a little bit better. Uh, that will be painted, uh, the lighter brown that you see on the hotel. So if anybody wanted to see the color, you can see it's just that lighter brown that we put in. Okay. Now, uh, there was some discussion that we just have to clarify with uh, the building officials as to if we put a rail in, what gets placed there because there's some there's some implications if we actually go in and put a rail on there right now there is no rail it's just that wood but i think there's a little bit of coordination that we'll be discussing with the uh, building officials as to 
what do we put up there? Because once we put something, there's some liability implications. Okay, I'm sure we can work that out. And yeah. then, John, can you talk a little bit about the when the as builds will come in for the Public Works Department and um, and our associate planner, Josh Altop, I think is still waiting for Excellent. landscape plans. We had uh, I have I have pretty strict budgets that we're following, uh, and at this point, we had uh, I have two landscape designs. Uh, one has come from the uh, landscape company that we are, uh, have been working with on property. The second landscape plan uh, is due uh, Tuesday of next week uh, to do the Sinatra. And it's uh, the landscape company that we're using, a landscape designer, actually has been working along Frank Sinatra as a part of the uh, Murata and uh, Villas Association. Uh, so they just came up. We walked them actually this morning. Uh, right now, the company that I'm using within the property came up with a plan that uh, blew past any budget that we had for Sinatra. So we're working that on them on pricing just to let you know what we're working on. So it, this is purely a, a pricing issue. There's a lot of work that has to be done up for uh, Sinatra. Uh, irrigation was neglected. Lighting was neglected. It is in disrepair. Uh, everybody is of the same mindset that uh, I'm looking at six weeks' worth of work just to prep to put in a single plant. Uh, and that is just getting the irrigation and lighting back in order. Thank you. Uh, because we're actually going all the way from the bridge all the way up to almost the Murata entrance worth of landscape. And so what I will do is as soon as uh, the second company, whatever company fits within my budget or as close to my budget as possible, uh, once I get that contract signed, I will bring up the uh, design to Josh so he can have a look at it. Thank you. John, will Sinatra be done by March 1? I have told both companies that uh, we need to get this negotiated within the next week, and they're to be complete by middle of January. <laughs> okay, good. And one company, actually the second company that we had walk at is asking for uh, end of January, first week in February for completion. Uh, Council, any questions of John? Ted, Bethy? Thanks, John. Terrific. Get, uh, get back, get to work. Thank you very and, much. And uh, we'll see you next see you. month. Take okay. Care. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll uh, now move along the agenda to non agenda public comments. And this is an opportunity for any of you who are in the audience that uh, are here to. Uh, are here but do not want to speak on a specific item on the agenda, we can give you three minutes to bring up any other subject you might want to discuss. And I have a couple of requests here to uh, talk. Uh, Carol Lang. Carol, if we could have your name address. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor and distinguished council members, my name is Carol Lang and I live in Cathedral City. I'm a residential homestay coordinator for a company called Green Planet, whose parent company is the Cambridge Institute of International Education. We specialize in bringing quality international students to quality private schools by providing quality host families to house these international students during their stay as they fulfill their goals of preparing to attend American colleges and universities. I'm here today to bring this information to the council and the community of Rancho Mirage in hopes that host families will come forward to take advantage of this incredible cultural opportunity. The students who will be coming will be coming from China and they will be attending the Palm Valley School, which is located right here in Rancho Mirage. They will be arriving in mid-January and staying until mid-June of 2014. Each host family, which can be as few as one, to as many as a family can hold, will be given a generous monthly stipend. We do require that the student be given a private bedroom and that the family provide meals and transportation to and from the school. We also offer a referral bonus of 150 to anyone who will refer a friend or family member and they are approved by Green Planet. So our company's web address is gphomestay.com and I have flyers for, for you that you can see all our information. 
And I want to thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you for letting me, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you for being here today. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next individual wishing to speak is John Tyman. Hello, John. Good morning, uh, afternoon, Mayor and uh, Council. Um, amidst all of this wonderful stuff, I, um, I feel awkward. I have something that seemingly is so non sequitur. I'm not really wanting to bring forth the uh, negativity of it. So I'll just uh, skip the stone over the water, if you will, um, hoping to get some more private um, revealing of what uh, my problem was created. I didn't create it, but at uh, Rancho Mirage um, Library, public library. It seems in it's such a wonderful setting that um, everything is wonderful, but um, it wasn't on that day of November 15th. Um, so I won't go into detail, but um, a Deputy Alvarez was called um, concerning some whatever. I can never fully explain things that are inexplicable to me. So if I can voice this in private to somebody, it, I'm not even pretending that it's so important. But to me it is, because you don't get the Sheriff's Department called on you. But I realized three strikes, you're out. This all, when I discovered with a phone call that the library is under the umbrella of this city hall, it made me realize that people are too quick to do horrendous things uh, out of their, uh, not going to use negative words, but uh, they, uh, they do some things that really disrupt somebody's life and uh, is really hurtful and uh, uncalled for. So um, Deputy Alvarez, I talked to him on the phone, and then later that day I called to have a keep the peace call by turning the tables and having him protect me from the library so I could go in and take care of my business because I was looking for two pieces of music to perform with. And uh, when Deputy Alvarez went in there with me, thankfully he showed up for the second time. I didn't know it would be him, but thankfully it was. Because then he realized live, in person, in dealing with the people I had been dealing with. Yep, I see. So I know that in your mind you're thinking they could have no failings, but um, hmm, I think that's, I think positively myself, but I'm also a pragmatic thinker, pragmatic actor and uh, a truthful person, and uh, a good guy. So when things like this happen, and I'm insulted so much because of their ineptness, and I'll stop at that word, but um, there's a checklist that is too long to go into now, that the intricacies of what unfolded that day to explain what really happened. But it should never, uh, it should never result in the calling of the sheriff before really accommodating the customer. It's, you know, except with just some fantasies in their head of um, I don't know what. But I noticed that when the caller is is connected, so to speak, I have a different meaning for the word connected, but when they're connected to a city hall or a powerful entity, that clinched it for me when I discovered that also the Ranch Mirage Library was connected under the umbrella to whatever degree with this city hall, I thought I should come here and tell you uh, it's most hurtful how some people can be over really literally nothing except that they, that which they conjure in their head. That's, that's a fearful thing. You cannot protect yourself against people who jump to contusions. Uh, they jump to conclusions, they jump to contusions. And I was a sufferer of the contusion and when they go unscathed. I think we should be better served um, rather than because they can't, they can't carry it off. They did not carry it off and they just did not care. It sounds like they couldn't possibly be characterized that way. I understand that because we love our own, but I love my own too. And my own was, 
was besmirched that day, and I am very resentful about it. It could stop here, but uh, if you, you know, want some more validity, I could explain it in privacy. I'm not going to go into the details of the failings of, you know, the individuals that day. It would be too, too much in depth. And uh, also, when I leave this podium today, um, if I'm not honored with some kind of ex explanation that takes more than three minutes, then so be it. I'll, uh, I'm just trying to get rid of these things by January 1, so I can go on with the important things in my life. But I'm trying to clear these um, little debris, if you will. I think I'm at three minutes and a third by now, right? I'm not keeping track. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. But I am. I'm pretty good at okay. that. So, and that's part of why I'm all the more besmirched by, by being treated in that manner that day uh, at Ranch Mirage, which is a wonderful place. It's, last time I was here was the signing. I know this place and um, too much. I'm uh, one of the good guys and I uh, hate being treated like uh, a bad guy. And I was treated like a bad guy that day. So enough with the wine and roses uh, and the violins. Um, I should leave this podium while I still do not go into repeating myself too much. I thank you, and if it does become possible to follow up with details with an appropriate person, whether it's the board or one of you, I think y'all need to know what happened that day so it doesn't happen again to a person not as strong as myself, someone who really takes it and cannot ever fight back. I'm fighting back today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Would you like to leave your name and yes. phone number with the city clerk and we'll certainly follow back up with you. Maybe Randy could um, Sure. Leave your name and phone number and I'd be happy to give you a call and we can sit down and meet. Okay, the next speaker is Brad Anderson. Brad? Thank you very much for seeing me. My name's Brad Anderson. I live on Ferber Drive in the city of Rancho Mirage. I'm not prepared to speak today, and I shouldn't, but uh, I received a violation or a, a citation on one of my uh, cars in my driveway this afternoon, and there was no courtesy letter sent. Apparently, I can't uh, well, I, I, my my driveway is, I got some sand on the side and I've been using this truck to load stuff in the back of the driveway, or back the backyard. So it's been moved off and on for probably the past two weeks. But apparently it's been there too long for the city. So, <laughs> but uh, there was no courtesy letter sent, nothing like that. And I just talked with Cold Compliance and Mrs. John, or Ms. Johnson and Diane, I can't pronounce the names, I'm sorry. Uh, the person that gave me the citation. And she informed me that says, I'm also building a privacy screening fence eight feet away from my neighbor's property line, and it's reasons to do with their running a business out of the home and so forth, but that's really what it's all about. And they were pestering my dogs and so forth. And so I, I was building that, but I was informed that my posts are too long. This is a fence under construction. The, fence is, the posts have not been cut off yet. But uh, apparently I need to do that right away. So I just, uh, I guess my main point here, I'm sorry about this. Uh, my neighbor moved next to me about nine years ago. They've been running a business out of the home, uh, a signage type thing and, uh, under the umbrella of an artist. And it's all life size, if not bigger, uh, meta art. And I've endured with the paint smell, the welding, the grinding, the metal sounds for years and years and years. And uh, I've carded uh, cold compliance over this. For, I've never writ, wrote a letter or anything, but I have talked to them many times about this. And I just kind of stepped it up a bit in the past year. And this is, I think this is what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm kind of around them going around in circles here and I talked well these people are also you know I've contacted code enforcement over this and I was informed that you know apparently they know well somebody in the council or something kind of let it go 
on the on the wayside. And uh, I know they had interactions with the city, these people, and my neighbors. And I also, a few weeks ago, I talked with certain members of the council here uh, concerning code and compliance. And the reason I did that is because I went ahead and uh, got some case reports from the city to see if they corresponded with my notes for, for this many, many years. And there was definitely things left out. Uh, there was one meeting about mitigation with my neighbor. And uh, I waited over a month to hear back. Uh, calling weekly to see what the response or see what the see if they were able to get a hold of my neighbors and there was nothing said about that at all in these case reports nothing and I and so that left led me to believe that maybe code compliance is not really doing the job not working for everybody working for a few okay that sounds pretty bad but it is uh, so I talked with the next person in charge of the code compliance stepping my way up here this is a a big step <laughs> and uh, they informed me they were concerned and they were going to look into this matter okay and this is only a couple weeks ago and now now I have a citation on one of my cars in my parking lot and and very defiant uh, I guess um, I, I perceived it as being defiant uh, attitude from the code compliance and uh, uh, I guess that's it and I don't know what else to do except uh, it's, um, my neighbor manufactures the stuff in the backyard and sells it in the front yard. There's always people coming and going, uh, uh, and they got workers there, and that's why my dogs get upset, I know. And, uh, and, the, and they call dog uh, police on me before, I guess. And, but it's just out of events for me trying to, I guess, stop their business. So could you excuse me could you um, when you leave could you take that to the front office ask them to make a photocopy to give it to the clerk and uh, that'll give us an opportunity to look at the um, citation that you're re referring to I, I, I would definitely do that thank you very much and and I guess this really if it is a big issue a courtesy letter would have been more than accurate I mean I can't this is this uh, I don't know. It's just way out of range. I think that's uh, trying to send a message. Don't mess with, you know, with us, I guess. I hate to say that. It just seems that way to me at this point. We'll certainly look into it. Thank you. And get back to you, too. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to speak today on non-agenda public items? Yes. Would you like to come forward? You know, Mr. Mayor, I think that the city's code compliance department tries to be fair and equitable, and I don't think that, um, you know, his insinuation that maybe there was some retribution there is a pretty serious allegation, and we'll have to take a look we'll at look that. We'll look into it, yes. Afternoon. Can I have your name and address, please? Uh, my name is Andy Gladstein, 60 Hillcrest Drive in Rancho Mirage. Uh, I wrote a letter, actually two letters, on behalf of uh, Murata. Uh, and I have received no responses back regarding the state of the Frank Sinatra Drive and why it hasn't been cleaned up. Uh, there's piping, irrigation piping, and all sorts of debris in the valley on the way up. It's been there for about six years. Around the water tower, there's dead trees and brush that hasn't been cleaned up. Uh, We've written letters to the city council. We haven't received responses back as to when it's going to be cleaned up and why it hasn't been cleaned up. And we'd like to know if it's going to be cleaned up or not, or if we need to clean it up ourselves. Okay. Andy, were you here for Mr. Hicks' presentation? Yes. Just a few minutes yes. ago. But it hadn't, this is not on the Ritz-Carlton property. You're, are you talking about Frank Sinatra, the road going up to the Ritz-Carlton? Sure, sure. Okay, well, he, he had mentioned that they are getting plans done right now. This, is, this has nothing to do with the Ritz property. This is on the far right side on the way up in the valley. There's all sorts of irrigation pipe that's been there for five or six years, Richard. Okay. In front of the water tower on the left side, the water tanks, there's dead brush, dead trees. Uh, it, it looks horrible. It's been there for a long time. And we, we have written letters to the city council about it. We had our attorney write a letter to you and to the other city council members. We never heard back. 
And we want to know who's responsible for cleaning it up. I, I don't remember getting the letter. Well, we, we have sent two copies of it. I can have our attorney send another copy, but okay. we asked for responses and get, got no response. I don't think any of the council, from what I'm seeing, has received your letter. When was it sent? Yes. In the end of August, 1st of September. Never, never received it. That's the first I've heard of any pipe or anything uh, sitting off the side of the road. Uh, well, well, we'll if, look you, if you drive it. up, all you do is look to the right and you see it in the valley and you look yeah. at the water tower and you see the dead trees and the dead bush. I mean, who's responsible for yeah. keeping for keeping Frank Sinatra beautified, I guess, is the question. Yeah. That's is something it, we'll have to look into and find out whose responsibility it is. Because I'm not sure whether it's Ritz Carlton or the new owner. Who's the owner of the land? Yeah, that's it, who. That's who would be responsible. It's this. It's got to be the city's. If it is the city, then we are responsible. Yeah. I, but we, I don't know. Do we know who the owner of the land is? I think don't doesn't the Marada HOA and forgive me for not having the term correct, but the Umbrella Association maintains the parkway landscaping on both sides. Primarily. Right, but we don't we don't maintain the 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 valley, and the the the. the when you go over the edge of Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. down into the ditches mm -hmm. towards Cathedral City, I'm speaking hundreds of yards. There's drainage pipe that's been there for five and six years. Yeah. If, it, if it's city-owned property, then uh, Councilman Hobart's right. The city will need to clean it up. And I think we did do a cleanup, Andy, on the water tank side some months ago. Is that right? Is that right, Josh? Didn't we do that? On the water tank side, yes. We did it. Uh, correct. But I, I, I guess it's, they, I'm very familiar with it. I guess the clarity is just exactly where. That's what we need to figure out. I think I know what you're talking about, and I got a good idea, but I want to make sure we're on the same piece of property. Well, if you drive up Frank Sinatra and look to the right as you're driving up, you'll see lots of white, long piping that's been there for years. If you look into the valley as you're driving up, you'll see lots of white piping that's been there for years that's rubbish, it's, it's trash. If you look towards the left as you're driving up where the water tank is, you'll see dead bushes, dead trees. It's been there for years. Well, you and know. I, and I'm going to have the attorney resend the letter that we sent. Well, well why don't you just come tomorrow morning and um, Josh and I will take a ride up with you and we'll get some pictures and we'll get it taken care of. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That must be a lot of irrigation piping or something from the previous mm -hmm. yeah. irrigation. I think yeah. there was some work that was done after the city was involved with the project, and I think there's some overflow irrigation that ended up having a lot of bushes grown up there. Okay. We'll uh, certainly look into it, though, Andy, and thanks for coming. Is there anybody else who has an on agenda public comment today? Okay, uh, we'll close the public comment and move on to city council comments. And I'll start with Ted. Ted, would you like to make a comment? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, Sarah, would you put up the slide, please. <clears throat> uh, we are regularly asked questions about the cell towers. Uh, we know in many areas the reception is poor. I thought what I would do is give you a summary of where we are now with cell towers, how many have been approved, how many are constructed. Uh, the map, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but the yellow indicates those that have been approved and are constructed, the orange is approved and never constructed and the blue is approved pending construction. Uh, for a summary, we have 21 cell towers in the Rancho Mirage area that are finished and working. We have 11 that were approved and never constructed. And that's always an issue because people will say the reception is terrible, and then when I check on it, uh, they say, well, it's impossible to get a permit with the city. The city's an obstacle. That's just never the case. What happens is many times a permit is approved and pulled, and then nothing happens for whatever reason, whether it's financial or the company has decided not to pursue it. But I can assure you that we have done our job 
and done everything possible to make sure the reception is clear. We have two cell towers pending construction at the moment, one at Vista, Vista del Sol in Frank Sinatra, which is AT&T, and one at Dinoshore at the Westin Hotel, which is AT&T. There have been only three permits that have ever been denied, and that's generally due to surrounding property owners that have a problem, uh, whether it be an eyesore or whatever, but only three to date. So the ratio of us turning down applications is absolutely bare minimum. We have two applications recently that were withdrawn, nine applications that have expired, and out of the 49 total applications, just to give you an idea, 37 have been approved, that's 46%, and 21 have been constructed, that's 43%. So our ratio of approval is very high, and we're still working diligently, we get complaints and we're working diligently to try to get the towers into strategic areas. I know that in the Mission Hills area, uh, reception is very poor, and we're hoping that maybe several of these new towers will help. And we also have, if, if any of you desire copies of the maps or the specific locations, we have them, they're color-coded. Uh, all you have to do is request them from the city clerk or at the desk, and we'll make them available to you. Uh, but rest assured, our, our track record of completing the cell towers is very, very high. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Unfortunately, we approve a number of cell towers, and then the, the entity who makes the application decides not to build a cell tower for one reason or another. So. We're constantly out there trying to improve the reception you get, and uh, it's just really based on the applicants and their ability to get approval and then to build it. And Thank further on that, on that point, if I could add, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say uh, that uh, they've contacted Verizon or AT&T complaining of poor service in various areas in the city. And they say that the provider, AT&T or Verizon or whoever, uh, tells them that the city uh, refuses to uh, grant them a cell tower. They lay it on the city, and it's a total false statement. So in case you've heard that, taint true, McGee. Iris, do you have any comments today? I do, but would you like to go first? Sure, I'm glad to go first. I, the reason I'm going to go first, I guess, she's deferring to uh, Shelby. Uh, we're going to meet Shelby. Here goes another kiss. Well, this is on, and uh, JJ, um, you're here today with Shelby. Tell us a little bit about Shelby. I'll hold her while you're talking. Uh, Shelby was a shelter interception. She was adopted from the shelter in July. She was also born in the shelter, and she spent several, several months through a conference gate case in the shelter. Um, we heard that she was going to be returned. We contacted the owner, and we said, you're not taking her back to the shelter. She's coming into our custody. Uh, we had to go through a little bit of a, a legal issue with her. Uh, we had to go in and fight in court, and she was awarded to our custody, and we love her. She's great with dogs. She's just a wonderful animal. Uh, she'll certainly make somebody happy. I've heard of a lot of custody battles, but I never heard of one over a, over a dog before. Although in divorce proceedings, it does become an issue. Maybe that was part of it. Uh, tell us about what's going on with uh, Bandits Resort Rescue. I understand there's some big news. I founded Bandits Resort Animal Rescue in February with a group of friends. Our whole dream was to develop a shelter. Not a shelter like the Coachella Valley Animal Campus, the Indio Shelter, 
more of an oasis or a pet resort. Uh, it's also a sanctuary where animals will live out their lives until they're adopted or they have illnesses and they can't uh, be adoptable. We just signed a contract this morning in Morongo Valley. We currently house six bait dogs that were uh, seized from a dog fighting ring in San Bernardino County. We have started development, fixing uh, kennels, runs. Uh, we have development of a pond in the center of the property. We have uh, trees that have been planted. Currently, the permits state that we can house 25 dogs. We have uh, expanded the property to where we can house up to 100 dogs. We also have a building on the site that can house up to 50 puppies uh, or 50 young offspring. We plan to uh, use this facility not as, uh, for the next year, we plan to use the facility in canine rehabilitation. A lot of our dogs that we want to save have been bait dogs in uh, dog fighting rings. They might have fears, they might be shut down. Uh, those animals are going to be housed at this facility. Once they have been rehabilitated, they'll move into fosters. We're going to do that during the, the time of development. Well, that's a fantastic story. And uh, I would like to remind people that if you adopt Shelby or any other pet from their rescue, uh, that the city of Rancho Mirage will pick up to $100 of the costs involved by any uh, Rancho Mirage resident. Well, JJ, good luck, and good luck in finding a home for Shelby, who's the sweetest little thing. Just curious and looking at everybody out there. There's a lot of weird people out there to look at, aren't there? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you very much, JJ. Thank you, Dana. Iris, are you ready? Sure. Okay. Okay. On November 7th, our city council was engaged in a significant civ civics debate. Namely, should taxpayer dollars be gifted to businesses to redecorate interior portions of their property? This issue, while voted down by Councilman Hobart Weil and myself, goes to the very core of transparency in government. Many residents have complained to me that the reporting of those proceedings on Rancho Mirage television was a dismal failure and left them with the feeling that the most important issues of our time, which is the spending of taxpayer dollars for private benefit, should be the focus of our concern and transparency. Not being able to view the individual's faces for the second half of the meeting and only seeing on an overview from the, of the chamber from the back of the room and only seeing the backs of heads of speakers was very annoying to say the least. After I saw the broadcast myself, I immediately asked for the reasons as to why the coverage was so inadequate and was so poorly covered on Rancho Mirage television. And what was being done to fix the problems, especially since this system is, was a major expense. I have recently been told that the problem has been remedied and um, perhaps Randy, you can let us know today uh, what happened, what took place, what the problems were, how they were remedied, and maybe you can report to our residents what the transmission problems were at that meeting and if that meeting's videos can be electronically repaired to broadcast to our residents the visual that was shown on the monitor that we all could see but uh, was not visible on Rancho Mirage television. So I know that a report has been put together and uh, if you could kind of go over it or uh, just let us know what the basis was for the problem. Certainly it was a technological malfunction and um, and staff, I, I understand staff worked most of the weekend to try to get it remedied and it still wasn't completed till what, Tuesday? Is that right? 
Uh, but I'd like to see if uh, Kim Malcolm Valente can at least respond to some of your questions. Okay. Or, or Sarah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we've had this system in place for about three years, and it has worked very well. This was the first example of a meeting where we had this particular technical problem. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it, it will, and with technology, that often happens. So uh, we don't rely on just one system. We have our primary system, which we're all accustomed to seeing. Josh is back there doing the live camera switching. Um, but in the event that that uh, fails for some reason, we do also have a static camera, which you can see back there in the booth. And um, unfortunately, since in that particular meeting our primary system did fail, we had to go to our backup system. We also have two audio sources, so should, again, the primary system fail, we do have a failover. So our goal is that uh, no matter what, we will have a uh, permanent record. We will have a video. Maybe it's not the the nice up close uh, camera shots we're accustomed to, but it is something that we can watch and we can listen to. And it is on YouTube. Should anyone need to watch it, it is available uh, from any device, 24 hours a day. You're welcome to see it. Uh, to answer your question about what has been done since that time, we did uh, upgrade our licensing on the post production software, which speeds up our uh, time for. Uh, editing and trying to get these uh, videos put together. Um, additionally, we purchased a second license so that we can have two systems running simultaneously. As I've mentioned in previous meetings, there um, is a rendering process that we have to go through for all the various uh, media types. So for example, for RMTV, for the DVD production, for YouTube. So instead of having to wait for one rendering to complete and then start the next, we can have two systems running simultaneously, which helps quite a bit. So I hope that answers your question. So, so what are the... Ch the unusual part about this was that we could visual, see what was going on here on these screens, as could the audience that were sitting in the room. And it was so strange that because we could see it and it was being transmitted somehow mm -hmm. to the big screens, why it was not able to be viewed or changed over to be viewed at the uh, home level on the Rancho Mirage television. Yes, it's the nature of the technology, unfortunately. What you see in the meeting is a live video stream. It is not a final rendered video. That takes some CPU processing time, and that is where we had the issue. So and it was after the five hours of streaming video when the system was trying to process and, and render it into something we could use. So the stream is not something that's uh, retained. It's compiled at the end of the meeting, and that's where the failure happened. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that there's no way of retrieving what we saw on the big screen so that it can be viewed at home. No, staff worked hours and hours on this and dedicated days to trying their very best because we know everyone is accustomed to the good video work that's done back there. Unfortunately, it just was not possible, and that's why we had to go to our backup system. So, so the recording that we have of the video, you can hear the mm -hmm. entire audio. Yes. But the video portion of it is the backup camera. Correct. So it's a single camera shot. So you can see the uh, all the dais and you can see the podium. And that's on the city's website correct. and there's a link to YouTube. Yes, that's correct. And if anyone wants a DVD, we keep them here at City Hall. They're welcome to come and ask for a copy. But the DVD does not show what was shown on our screens. It does not have the individual tight camera shots like I can see right now, a tight camera shot of you, Can't but it has the wide screen so it can see everyone. Right. And that's, a, that's the overview mm -hmm. from the back of the room. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Is there any way that it can be played and can be recorded or filmed from the screen mm, so that no. a new recording can be made, a new disc can be made? No, that's from not the possible. Okay, so that's completely lost. Correct. The final product that we produced was a single camera shot that shows the entire day right. and the podium. Yes. And that was the backup camera. That's correct. That's right. the backup camera. So thank goodness we had a backup in place. Otherwise, we'd have nothing. Well, I would, I, I would assume with the system that we have, that, that would be. And again, this was the first issue in three years. 
Right. And I think everyone. Well, I think I think the fact that this is a, these are very important meetings that backup cameras are always important. Yes, and we have one. Okay. And Sarah, can you, um, Mayor Pro Tem's other question had to do with the upgrades that you've made to the system yes. to ensure that that doesn't happen. Can you explain that? Sure. So uh, one of the uh, complaints we received was that it took us too long to try to work with the uh, the video that we had to try to piece this together and make something. So we went ahead and um, upgraded to uh, a, um, a higher level, which uses more CPU processing, so it uh, works faster. And in addition, we purchased a second license so that we can have two systems working simultaneously. Do you happen to remember what the cost of something like that was? Are we, are we the, going into a major investment? No, no, no. The software cost was a couple hundred dollars, not major at all. Okay. And the second licensing is so when one staff member is working, another one can be working simultaneously. You got it. So, so, and the intention will be that the videos are available the Friday after the council meeting? That's always our goal. Sometimes it does take longer, but that's always our goal. And oftentimes we have them the same day, which is just remarkable turnarounds. When we had a third party doing this, it was typically much longer. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Iris. Uh, just a, a brief comment uh, under council comments. I want to bring everybody up to date on the study session we had today before this meeting uh, with CV Link. Uh, Tom Kirk, the uh, executive director of CVAG, was here to give us a presentation on C, uh, CV Link, which you probably read about in the newspaper in the last few days. This is going to be an $80 million project, and it will span from Palm Springs to Coachella approximately 50 miles. Uh, the meeting today with, with uh, council and staff was primarily to talk about CV Link and its impact on Rancho Mirage. And so we spent an hour and a half or so talking about how it will impact the residents of Rancho Mirage and what our concerns are as far as city council in looking at the route that the CV link will take. Uh, so over the next few months and, and probably over the next couple of years as the final decisions are made, we will be able to work with CVAG to make sure that our residents are protected and there are a number of routes that are being proposed right now. No decision has been made. There are a long ways from finalizing the routes uh, but uh, we will keep you informed as to what goes on with the CV link in Rancho Mirage. And if you have any questions or concerns about your particular property or how you might be impacted, I would like to invite you to contact the council members or uh, city staff, uh, and they can certainly answer those questions. So something we're going to keep you updated on in the next uh, months and years we think it's really important that all of you know exactly uh, what the CV link is about and how it may impact you. We hope to eliminate any major impact on anybody in Ranch Mirage. So that's why the meeting was held today. So uh, moving on to the next item, uh, that's the uh, minutes from the meeting of uh, November 7th and November 21st. And I know everybody received those a little bit late. I don't know whether you've had an opportunity to look at them, uh, but if you have, uh, I'd like to motion to approve the minutes from the 7th and the 21st. I would move to approve the minutes okay, from November 7th and November 21st. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second, please? I'll second. And Ted uh, seconds the motion. Please vote. And the motion carries 4-0 with one absent. We'll now move on to the consent calendar. And the consent calendar are items of routine in nature, may be approved by one blanket motion. And is there anybody who would like any of the consent items pulled today? Okay, I'll turn it over to our city manager, Randy Binder, who will go through the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. You have one item on your consent calendar today. That is approval of contracts and purchase orders. There's about a half a dozen uh, purchase orders and half a dozen contracts that are in your um, 
consent calendar. If you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you. A new record for the consent calendar, huh? What was that? <laughs> okay, can I have a motion? Uh, is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on the one item on the consent calendar? Okay, it's council. Uh, can I have a motion, please, to approve the consent calendar? So moved. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Please vote. Mayor Cut, could you tell your vote again? I'm sorry, ma'am. Thank you. And the motion carries 4 0 with one absent. Uh, what I'm going to do now is take an item out of order just so that uh, we can accommodate a couple of people who are here today on this item. We're going to move to action item number six, which is the consideration of modifications to the Ranch Mirage Golf Club program. And uh, Randy, are mm -hmm. you going to handle this? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Gloria Grego, our contract specialist, has been working on this the last couple of days with the subcommittee, and we'll give you a brief update and turn it back over to the subcommittee. Mayor, City Council, on November 7th, the golf the golf club subcommittee, Mayor Kite and Councilman Hines presented agreement terms for the city's golf club. And the city council requested further input and directed staff to schedule a study session. On November 21st, the city council held the study session and invited Rancho Mirage Golf Club members to provide comments related to the status and previously negotiated terms. Council heard comments and a new council golf club negotiating subcommittee made up of Councilman Hobart and Councilman Weil was formed to further negotiate the terms of the agreement with the Weston. The new subcommittee is ready to present the negotiated terms for the 2014 City Golf Club Agreement, which are outlined in the staff report. I will now turn it over to Councilman Weil. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, over the last several weeks, uh, we've had uh, a number of meetings, mainly Councilman Hobart and myself, uh, with representatives of the city golf program uh, and uh, the representative of the Westin Hotel uh, in order to uh, create an arrangement that would be satisfactory to all parties. Uh, the Weston Hotel initiated discussions that they wanted to be more actively involved in the operation of the program, and we felt that it was critically important for the city to maintain the ability to qualify our residents for membership in such a program. And so we have come to an agreement that essentially satisfies all parties. It will be a two-step process that essentially will focus on an individual coming to the city, will be filling out an application, it will certify that the person is a permanent resident of the city, a seasonal resident, or an employee of the city. And the standard use of either a utility bill, a property tax bill, or a rental agreement or a lease will provide verification that that individual is eligible to join the golf program. And the application will have a seal of the city on it. That application will then be taken to the Weston Hotel, where the Weston will essentially complete the process, will accept the membership fee and all of the terms and conditions that Councilman Hobart will describe. So we're very pleased it uh, continues the exclusivity uh, of members of 
residents of Rancho Mirage being able to enjoy the benefits of the neighboring Western courses. And what's happened, of course, over the past number of years, uh, the golf industry as a whole has gone through a metamorphosis whereby uh, older individuals are dropping out of the golf world and not being replaced by younger individuals and also uh, people that are part-time residents are just not willing to pay a lot of money uh, when they're not here the full year so that the men's golf program serves a very very valuable niche and I'd be remiss to say that the program was started 11 years ago by Councilman Hobart and Ron Mepos who is no longer with us and they were instrumental in the program and it became a huge success and we're pleased that we're able to continue the relationship with the Weston Hotel which has been extremely enjoyable. Dana if you'd be kind enough to fill in the details of the program. I'll be glad to at first I'd like to uh, thank uh, Ross Meredith the general manager of the Weston who is in the back there looking a dapper as always and um, if he doesn't scream during my recitation of what our deal is uh, then we'll know that we have a meeting of the minds uh, I'd like to thank you Ross for putting in the extra time that it took to get this resolved uh, in a fashion that's satisfactory to all concerned uh, to begin with uh, there will be no change in the number of days uh, of advanced tea times it'll remain four for club members which will be more than others who are paying $75 in other programs that the Western may have. <clears throat> the program will be for a minimum of one year, effective December 1. They started the program on December 1, so it goes to November 30, and uh, we'll make that adjustment. Uh, the City Golf mem members will be charged $75 uh, from January 1 to actually November 30th. Uh, next year uh, <clears throat> at the end of um, one year at the end of the first year both parties that is the city and the Weston have to exercise the option to renew and continue and um, if one side decides they don't want to exercise the option uh, that will be the end of the program and if it happened to be the Weston that made that decision we have no reason to think they will or we will but if it were them uh, then uh, the city of Rancho Mirage Golf Club would turn to other avenues to try to find other courses to uh, fill the needs of our members and uh, uh, we would move in that direction hopefully uh, we won't have to uh, we'll continue to have the relationship with the Western that we've had for some time now um, all golf rates for the coming year remain the same both for green fees and guest fees uh, that's no change in each of the outlying two years that would be year number two or year number three if there is to be a change in rates on either of those years uh, the Weston uh, will not charge more than a five percent increase uh, in any of the rate categories including dues <clears throat> Uh, I think that uh, Ted has explained the process that all members to become a member of the Ranch Mirage Golf Club you have to come to City Hall and get some type of a, an official document that we are in the process of preparing you take that document to the Weston and the Weston certifies you as a member of the club and eligible for the benefits of the club and um, if somebody goes to the Weston who lives in Rancho Mirage and who is not a member of the club, the Weston has agreed that before they can become members, they will send them to City Hall so they can secure uh, the permit uh, to join the club uh, that we will offer. Part of the reason for that is, is if the uh, club should, or if the Weston should at some point in time feel it's not to their economic satisfaction uh, to uh, continue the program, we the city will continue to have a complete up-to-date list 
with all of the vital information of all of the members so that we can immediately step into a different uh, mode if that were forced upon us. Uh, either party can, as I said, can terminate uh, by not renewing an option. Uh, nobody will have, there is no, will be no termination for cause uh, by either side. The only method of terminating will be not to renew at the end of one year or not to renew at the end of two years or three years. I think that's uh, pretty much, uh, oh, the rest of the agreement that had been negotiated uh, previously uh, by the uh, golf subcommittee will remain in effect, and we will put that together, Ross, very quickly as soon as uh, uh, this is passed today, and I'm assuming it'll be passed in just a few moments. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dana. Are there any questions of staff or the subcommittee members? Okay, is there anybody in the audience who would like to uh, address this issue? Have any questions or comments? Okay, uh, seeing none. Dana, I just had one question. Regarding the 5% step up in years two or three, is there any basis for determining what that amount might be? The basis is simply a limitation. They cannot, they cannot exceed 5%. Okay, could they have it less? They could have it less, and uh, as the agreement makes clear, uh, they retain all rights of administration and management of the program. Uh, so uh, they could definitely, they don't have to increase it. They didn't increase it this year. Right. And, uh, and we really haven't had any increases in about 10 years. Yeah, so yeah. there's no reason to think they're going to, okay. but if they did, it would be limited to okay. a max of 5%. Okay, and it would really be based on the financials which they present to us justifying that increase. Well, I don't know that they would have to justify it to us under the new agreement because under the new agreement they have management and administrative control of the program. But I'm sure they would discuss it with, it, with us and they would try to uh, secure mutual uh, satisfaction and agreement to it. And knowing Ross, he always likes to have everybody happy. Okay. I was going to say, maybe Ross wants to say that absolutely never will there be an increase, but I somehow don't think, yeah, he's shaking his head before I could finish the sentence. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion, please. You may make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the City Council approve modifications to the Rancho Mirage City Golf Club Program and Agreement and direct staff to prepare a new contract and to prepare the form that we will be using to send uh, people who register with us for the club the form to be taken to uh, the West. It, actually, we've got the form prepared. We did that today in anticipation of approval because people will start to come in tomorrow, I'm sure, Excellent. looking for that form. Excellent. I'll second the motion. While has it. Okay, there's been a motion and a second. Would you please vote? Okay, the motion carries 4-0 with one absent, and this will make sure that Rancho Mirage continues to have one of the best city golf programs in the Valley. Okay, we will now move back to uh, the public hearing items, uh, which is, will begin with number two, which is the environmental assessment case number EA130002 and general plan amendment case. Uh, regarding the housing element. And Josh, are you going to handle this? Yes, sir. Thank you, okay, Mayor. Josh, Thank you're on. Thank you. Thank you, fellow council members. Uh, this is an application that's on behalf of the city of Rancho Mirage. It's an update to our housing element that's required per state code. It's something we have to do uh, every so many years. Right now, we're going to be in a seven-year cycle, and this will repeat itself, so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, the goals and policies of the program. Let me back up. Excuse me. I, I believe I got my slides backwards, but I'll figure it out. Uh, the purpose of the housing element is to facilitate development of all housing types. It's to identify and reduce constraints to the development of affordable housing. Third, it identifies how the city will meet mandated housing targets, which are arena numbers, for the 2014 through 2001 period. And fourth, it establishes goals, policies, and programs to help meet those targets. Uh, the housing element itself must include a review of the element's current policies, programs, uh, to determine their effectiveness, so that was our last cycle from 2006 to 2013, 
It includes an analysis of our demographic information. Uh, it does an inventory of our current existing affordable housing projects. It does an analysis of the constraints to the housing development itself. We have to do a site-specific inventory of all available sites that could house this affordable housing. And then it sets up our new goals and policies for the upcoming cycle, as well as any updates in state laws. Um, as we go through this process, we get numbers through SCAG, which is the Southern California Association of Governments, and they're allocated based upon current economic, current trends in housing development. If you look at our numbers from 2006 to 2013, based upon those income levels, they were very, very skewed. And these are all due to the uh, economic times that was during the house boom of the early 2000s up until about 2005, 2006. So the numbers were, were highly, highly irregular. It was a, a real blip in statistical anomaly. If you look at our current numbers from 2014 to 2021, it's dropped to 95 units. So it's been, been quite a reduction, which is much more in line and much more in queue as far as what's going on in this, in, uh, this economic time. My, my, my apologies, I apologize for getting it out of order. Uh, the goals and policies of this particular program uh, have not changed significantly from reviewing them from the last one. We've made several small updates. Uh, there has been no proposed changes in our land use designation. Uh, due to the changes in state law, we have to do two following things following this specific update. One is to modify the zoning ordinance to allow transitional and supportive housing as a residential use in all zones, which allow residential development. And that'll come through uh, either a individual uh, code update or through a major code update, but we'll specify for council. The second one is the section 19 specific plan will need to be amended to establish a minimum densities of 20 unit per acre for the site exclusively designated for residential use. If the council will remember through ordinance 1047, we did this about a year and a half ago, and that was because of the last housing cycle required such a large number of housing units we had to put in the densities in order to reach those numbers. The plan was to have that expire upon the end of this housing cycle. However, the state mandates now that this is a rule for those housing, those specific zones. So this is something, unfortunately, that we can't look to the other way or, or ignore. This is something we have to do through the state. Uh, in conclusion, the housing, the housing element, if adopted, will result in state certification assuring that the city is compliant with state law until 2021. The element contains all required policies to facilitate the city's fair share of housing for all income levels between now and 2021. Uh, the actual construction of these particular units would be based upon market conditions. We're not being forced to have to do any physical construction from this document. And this element itself is a guidance tool and individual projects when they are proposed will be individually going through some form of entitlement process which the council will review, including its own CEQA analysis. Staff has two recommendations. Number one is the filing of a neg deck environmental impact based upon environmental assessment case number 13002, finding that no significant impact. And number two, the general plan amendment updating the housing element of the general plan for the 2014-21 cycle. Um, that concludes my presentation. Our housing consultant, Nicole Chris from Terra Nova, is present for any additional questions the council may have. And uh, that'll be it. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Is there any uh, question of staff? OK, uh, this is a public hearing. So we'll open the public hearing and see if anybody has a question or comment in the audience. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And go to council for a motion, please. Well, I would move, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, that uh, the council approve the environmental assessment case number EA 130002, finding that the update of the housing element will have no impact on the environment. I think we have to make the other amendments separately. Right. Second. Second. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. And, Councilman, that includes adopting a negative declaration of environmental impact. Yes, it does. Right. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Weil, could you draw your vote? I mean, I voted twice. Two or three times. Motion carries 4-0 with one absent. And I Dana? would also move that uh, the Council approve general plan update case number GPA. 13001, updating the housing element of the general plan for the 2014 to 2021 housing cycle. Second. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Uh, motion carries 4 0 with one absent. 2021, Dana, where are we, uh, are we going to be back here to make we'll sure? We'll be sitting right here. Right here, okay. Yeah. 
Francisco Bay, if I can thank uh, our housing consultant, uh, Nicole Christ with Terranova Planning and Research, and our associate planner, Josh Altop, for heading this project up over the past nine months, I want to say, a year, including workshops towards the end of last year. Thank you very much. Thank you from the council, too. Okay, uh, the second item under the public hearings today is item number three, preliminary development plan extension of time, case number PDPX130001 for preliminary development plan case number PDP070115 Five Peaks as modified through a case number MOD11009. And uh, Randy, who's going to be in charge of this? Uh, Bud Cop, Planning Manager. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, members of the council. The uh, applicant for Five Peaks is requesting an extension of time for the preliminary development plan and continu continued endorsement of the phasing plan, which includes the two small pad buildings and Highway 111 frontage uh, improvements in Phase 1. As you may recall, the project is located on Highway 111 across the street from the Rancho Mirage Library between the VCA Animal Hospital and the West Magnesia Storm Drain Channel. In June 2009, the City Council approved the preliminary development plan and the tentative tracks map as a single phased project consisting of 229,000 square feet on 13 and a half acres. Among some of the buildings that were included, uh, include, uh, as shown on the screen, the orange 106,000 square foot anchor building, an 87,000 square foot paseo consisting of four attached structures shown in yellow, a 7,000 and a 9,000 square foot pad building shown in the peach color right at the intersection on Highway 111, a 20,000 square foot uh, spa building towards the eastern side of the property and a parking structure along the rear. Two years after initial approval, the applicant determined that it wasn't feasible to construct the entire center as a single phase project and submitted a major modification application uh, to phase the project. At that time, the applicant only proposed one small pad building as phase one. Staff then met with the commercial development subcommittee consisting of then Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Council Member Mepos to discuss the applicant's request to phase the Five Peaks development. Although the subcommittee was not enthusiastic about the phased approach, they did feel it was a reasonable concession in light of the economic recession. The subcommittee and then the council approved the phasing plan, but required at minimum the first two pad buildings uh, be constructed and all Highway 111, Highway 111 frontage improvements be required as a part of phase one. Uh, last year, the council approved a time extension for the preliminary development plan and phasing plan. During the past two years, the applicant has submitted two separate final development plan applications for phase one, but both applications expired due to incompleteness and were not uh, in compliance with the conditions of approval as established by the city council. It should be noted, however, that over the past couple years, the applicant has been moving forward to fulfill various conditions of approval, which included funding the newly constructed pedestrian bridge over the West Magnesia Storm Drain Channel and other engineering and architectural obligations for the eventual submittal of the final development plan for phase one. In October of this year, the Planning Commission held a public hearing to consider the time extension for the Five Peaks preliminary development plan and phasing plan. Staff and the Planning Commission uh, remain concerned about continuing to support a backwards phased approach where pad buildings are constructed prior to the anchor and theme buildings for the project. Uh, constructing the pad buildings prior to the main portions of the center was granted primarily as a concession to the developer to keep the project moving forward during the difficult economic times. Uh, at the request of the applicant, the commission continued the planning commission meeting in October for two weeks to allow the applicant to meet with staff and to discuss our recommendation. At our meeting, staff suggested that the applicant draft a letter providing a clear explanation of why the project did not move forward over the last two years, along with providing other assurances that quality uses and comprehensive management and maintenance of the entire center would be achieved. 
Included in your agenda is the applicant's letter of response and supplemental information which did not alter our staff recommendation to the Planning Commission. We remain unconvinced that the pad site should be developed prior to the most important parts of the centre. The Planning Commission agreed and recommends that the City Council find no further environmental analysis is required for this project under CEQA and the Planning Commission also recommended approval of the time extension for the preliminary development plan but let the modification plan for the phasing expire. The applicant will still have the ability to file a final development plan in compliance with a single phased project and can request time extensions for the preliminary development plan entitlements through 2017 or as long as the tentative map remains valid. Uh, it's my understanding that the applicant is not in attendance today. A representative of the applicant uh, may be here um, uh, and he may wish to speak. Uh, staff would be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. So Planning Commission recommended the extension, but not the phasing in, is that correct? That's correct. The Planning Commission recommended extension of the preliminary development plan, and the recommendation was to let the modification plan expire, which was what established the phasing. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any questions from uh, Council? I yes, do, Iris. I, I do have a question. Number one, um, I notice on the plan here that could, the... Um, could you get a little bit closer to your mic? I notice on the plans here uh, that there is no um, mention here, I believe, of the hotel that was supposed to be included in this uh, complex. Um, that's correct. The original preliminary development plan only included the 229,000 square foot shopping center. The proposed resort hotel that you're referring to was on parcel five, and we have not processed any entitlements for that. That would be a future project. That was kind of a wish list type of item. Right, and also noting here that the um, the developer or the owner at this time is seeking a major developer with which to partner or to which to sell the project as presently approved so uh, I, I can I can respond to that as well okay. I have been in uh, I have been in contact with not only the applicant but an interested uh, broker that is working with two potential um, uh, parties, one would be interested in developing out the shopping center as entitled as, as what you're considering today for the extension. Uh, another party would be interested in, in acquiring the, uh, the unentitled parcel five, which uh, they uh, have an interest in developing a resort hotel. And are they hoping if they do acquire this parcel to be able to move on this quickly? Um, the, if you if you approve the entitlements today or the time extension today for the shopping center, um, that can happen very quickly. The uh, hotel portion we have to take that through the preliminary development plan application, which does require review by the architectural review board and the planning commission recommendation to council for final consideration. And that process would probably take. Um, we've already done the majority of environmental analysis uh, for the hotel, so. So uh, it's mainly architectural design issues, which um, uh, could take as little as uh, four, four to five months to process. Okay. But the hotel would still be in the last phase? Uh, not necessarily. The develop, if there was someone interested in developing a hotel now, we would have to process a preliminary development plan, but that could, be, that could be considered a phase one, just like if the applicant wanted to come back with a different phasing plan for your consideration, uh, they could propose either the Paseo or the Anchor Building first, which I think staff would be more inclined to support than the two small pad buildings. Uh, we have a concern about the two pad buildings being built first, and then selling the balance of the shopping center to another developer and having the two pad buildings dictate the final design of the overall center. And only about 8% of the square footage in this uh, development plan uh, is the pad, the pad buildings. Yes, and that's exactly my concern, that these buildings would be built and then a new buyer would uh, not find it as desirable. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for you. all your effort on this. Thank you. You're welcome. Ted, did you have a question? Uh, one, one point. When, when this originally was proposed, <clears throat> um, 
it was, uh, and part of the appeal was that it was going to be a, a green project. And uh, is that still part of the concept, or has that changed over a period of time? Originally, the applicants submitted uh, a preliminary application for LEED, and they were going for a LEED Gold uh, certification. Now, what we did in the environmental document for this project is we included uh, what they said they were going to do in uh, as part of the LEED Gold application. We included those as conditions of approval. So they are bound to a, quite a few uh, environmental uh, sustainable types of uh, uh, um, they, they have to recycle all the rocks on site. They, um, uh, there, there are a lot of different environmental techniques, um, uh, low VOC paints. Um, so yes, they would be conditioned. They are conditioned to do that. However, it's my understanding in talking with the applicant over the last couple of years that they may not actually pursue LEED certification, but nevertheless, the conditions are still there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dana, did you have any comments? Okay. Uh, this is a public hearing, uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to see if there is a representative from the applicant here today. Would you like to come forward and say anything? Thank you. Got here just in time. <laughs> you weren't supposed to notice that part. Uh, uh, name and address, please. Uh, the... Uh, Developer, uh, Five Peaks LLC, would like me to read their statement regarding their strong desire to have the uh, phasing plan uh, continued because of the potential for getting the ball rolling with that in place versus trying to get somebody to get the ball rolling, get the infrastructure across the street with the Paseo or the anchor tenant. And your name is? My name is, <laughs> sorry, my name is Keith Gregory. I work for Dudek the civil engineer for the project that's located in Palm Desert okay thank you um, I haven't read this through for many times so please bear with me uh, as you consider the recommendation to eliminate the phasing plan per staff recommendations and Planning Commission vote please bear in mind and to reiterate the following items one thus far this project has been one only on paper and has very limited value in interesting a developer or partner to purchase the project in its present form. We have made no secret that we are actively searching for a suitable, suitable developer to, as a joint venture partner or buyer to help complete this project. Uh, having attended the ICSC in Las Vegas last May, we have identified and are in the process of exchanging information with over 20 potential and interested development partners. In addition, we are presently in talks or in information exchange with one party interested in the adjacent nine acre parcel, uh, not presently in the PDP for a hotel uh, development in addition to the uh, present project. Uh, two, while we continue to pursue this project, uh, but without the progress listed above, Elimination of the phasing plan poses significant delays to bringing the full project to fruition. We would have to go back and sort of start over. We've got a lot of design work done for those front two buildings. Completion and mapping of the frontage parcels delineates and sets the tone for the future development plans, as well as puts the infrastructure in place to attract the interested uh, buyers discussed above, uh, including the potential hotel site. Uh, three included in our letter of response were two but of many real estate industry reports that indicate the development and delivery of large multi-tenant specialty real estate projects is still near historic lows and very sluggish growth in compared to other retail sectors. Sectors. We disagree with staff and firmly maintain the delivery of the office space and single tenant retail space are not relevant indicators of the health of the multi-tenant retail sector, the, the mall and the anchor. Uh, further, staff cited the new Audi dealership uh, on the corner of Rancher Mirage and Highway 111, uh, excuse me, as on Mirage Road and Highway 111 
adjacent to the project as evidence of improving, improving economic conditions. We would like to clarify that while this building is new, the dealership is uh, not a new addition to Rancho Mirage and simply a relocation from another venue on Highway 111, not really indicating things are growing like we need to develop the full site. Uh, even today, uh, December 5th, Rudu's reported growth in consumer spending, which accounts for more than two-thirds of the U.S. economic activity, was revised down to a 1.4 percentage rate, the lowest since the fourth quarter of 2009. It had previously been estimated to have been increased at 1.5 percent pace. This is a key indicator in the decision-making process used by developers in bringing major development, retail development to the market. Regarding concerns about the present and future plans for the phases and their relation to each other, staff, uh, the Planning Commission, and uh, city uh, folks have uh, the requisite authority at their uh, disposal in the PDP and the FDP approval processes to ensure the project is of the nature uh, that meets the original intent and uh, or as some acceptable alternative which includes the land use and architectural consistency that everybody's worried about. You know, we don't want to, we're not looking to sneak in halfway and then finish differently. We want to continue following the conditions. Um, while progress has been slowed by economic conditions, the owners were only first notified by the staff of the recommendation and planning commission agenda to receive uh, approximately five days before the scheduled meeting and approximately four months after uh, submitting its application to extend the phased PDP. They were called a little off guard. Uh, five team, the Five Peaks team simply requests that the phased PDP be extended uh, to its or a final expiration date of May 2014, six more months. If progress has not been made by then, the phasing plan could be allowed to expire as recommended. And that's uh, from Steve McAdams, the uh, project representative, Five Peaks Land, LLC. Okay, thank you. Can you answer questions on behalf of the applicant? <laughs> I can sure answer questions better I can read, so yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, item number two, talking about the design work that's already gone in to the new buildings, which were the first phase. Can you talk a little bit about that and when, where do you stand on that? <laughs> uh, CVODB is ready to sign off on the plans and install sewer and water. Uh, they want the landscape plans approved, which are a little farther behind. Uh, the final development plan has been in review for the first two front buildings, and I don't think the comments on that were so severe that that's far off in the future, but the civil engineering is much farther along uh, in regards of having all the parking areas designed, the underground storm retention designed. So um, flipping it from saying not building the front and building the back, we can still use the backbone we've designed, but it is a considerable architectural effort to bring in all of the uh, structural facades and all the details for those buildings when we've already figured out what we want to do for the front too. Um, and, and do you have tenants right now lined up for those properties? I'm always told almost or with just this one other thing. So I, I'm not in on the actual dealings as to who's going to show up when. Okay. But I would, I would say, though, that there's a lot more serious consideration for a site that it's not just empty land. If we could get the water, sewer, and some of the other structures, the intersection put in place, we've got a whole lot more interest to somebody to say, Yes, you just have to tap into what's on this side of the street. You're not trying to jump across a highway. You're not trying to uh, solve all these other issues with development on the street. And the key item is now you're just building what you want to build on the inside. Okay. Bud, can you bring us up to date as to the status of the plans that have been submitted for review? Sure. The, um, there have actually been two final development plans that have been submitted. Um, one was submitted um, in, I think, January 2011, and that one just proposed one of the two pad buildings, which we found 
inconsistent with council's original entitlement of a single phase project. Uh, then we went through the process of phasing, phasing it and council approved the phasing plan um, about 26 months ago. And uh, due to inactivity on that final development plan, that did expire. Under our current code, if the applicant does not finish uh, or, or staff cannot determine a development plan to be complete within six months, it automatically expires. So the first time the FDP was submitted, it expired because we did not have the first two buildings and all the frontage improvements uh, in a final development plan form to approve. And then uh, earlier this year, the applicant submitted another final development plan. Uh, and this time they did submit um, both buildings. And um, that plan, we wrote an incompleteness letter. I believe it was June 6th. It was early June. And we did not hear back from the applicant, and that naturally expired after 180 days in September of this year. So there is no valid application for a final development plan right now. We would have to get a new one. Uh, it would have to be determined to be complete, and council would have to extend the phasing plan in order for us to accept uh, a multiple phase project in this case. So, uh, and then also I might mention that there are several conditions of approval that still have yet to be met, such as entering into contract and maintenance agreements, which take a little bit of time, and even a development agreement, which of course, as you know, has to go through planning commission and council and could take several months. So um, there are quite a few outstanding items for a final development plan. Have you received any uh, plans at all for the architectural design of the buildings? For phase, yes, for phase one, which consists of the two pad buildings, we did receive uh, information earlier this year, but it was incomplete, and that's when we wrote the letter in early June stating the application's incomplete, we need additional information, and several of the conditions of approval that council uh, established were not fulfilled, so we couldn't approve the final development plan. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Ted? Any uh, questions uh, of the applicant? Well, I'll, I'll ask Bud this question. It may be appropriate. If, if this were extended and approved, would it automatically expire, including the phasing, uh, June 18th of 2014? Unless the applicant applied for another extension. Right. Yes. But as of now, if this were approved, it would automatically expire. It would automatically expire June 18th of right. 2014. Um, the code says that the applicant can apply for a time extension 30 days in advance of the right. application expiring. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, speak on this item since the public hearing is open? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and go back to uh, council if you have any questions of staff or if you would like to make a, a motion. I'd like to make a comment that um, uh, granted the, you know, economic conditions have been uh, very difficult and this is a project that we all had great expectations that it would be completed and of course successful now, we've gone quite a ways and indeed uh, the applicant probably is trying to get either a joint venture partner or to sell the entire project uh, personally I feel I would recommend that the project, including the phasing, be extended to June uh, 18th, 2014. Uh, at that time, everything expires. Uh, and the applicant, as Bud said, would have to reapply. But I think that we have gone this far. Uh, I hope the end isn't in sight in June. But it seems to me that they are now working diligently to conclude something. And I would make the recommendation for the extension, including the phasing. Uh, and I would hope that it wouldn't expire, that there would be something concrete done. 
You said you were making a recommendation. Are you making a motion? Unless there's other, I'll be happy to make a motion unless there's other, other comments. Well, by. we can have other comments if you want to make a motion. All right, I'll make a motion. Um, I guess it'll be uh, two motions. Uh, would we not have to first uh, do the environmental analysis? Yes. yes. So the first motion would be that find that uh, no further environmental analysis is required pursuant to CEQA section 15162 based upon the findings contained in the staff report. Is there a second? Okay, is there any discussion on this item? Okay, would you please vote? And the motion carries 4-0 with one absent. And uh, now we have the second part of the item. And I would make um, a motion to approve preliminary development plan case number PDPX 13001, paren time extension paren, uh, based upon the, con the contents, findings, and conditions in the staff report, setting a new expiration date of June 18, 2014. The applicant must receive approval of a final development plan during this period to keep the entitlement valid and or may be eligible for future extensions of time in compliance with section 17.42.130 per end time extensions for development plans Paren. And your motion includes uh, the phasing in? Yes. In oh. other words, I, I left out the expiration of the phasing. Okay. So there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll second it. Okay. Any discussion on this motion? My only question is, is, is this exactly what staff is recommending? No. Or have you made any... You've made some modifications uh, to that? The, the, uh, you can tell what the modification is. No, the modification, staff recommended not approving right. the phasing, phasing. And I'm suggesting my motion is to include the phasing um, up through June of 2014. Um, I feel that uh, uh, the developer is, is at the point now where the additional six months are important either to sell a project or get a joint venture partner and i can understand the phasing would be of assistance and if nothing happened between now and then at that time you'd be in favor then of eliminating it of, of everything expiring yeah, everything expires in june right, right. okay okay iris did thank you have you. any further no that's fine okay. thank you and dana you second the motion yeah, I did. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, any questions regarding that motion? If not, please vote. Mr. Mayor, excuse me, could I just make yes. one quick comment? Yes, uh, since there may. was a little discussion about the impact of the phasing, not weighing in one way or the other, but just so that the council is aware that if, if I'm correct, and please tell me but if I'm not, is that if the party did move forward under that phasing plan to build the first two pads, there is no guarantee that the remainder of the project would be built. So you could have a situation even with this June of 2014 situation where they are proceeding with the two pad buildings, but there is no guarantee or requirement that they build out the rest of the project if the phasing is effectively right. kept into the program. Well, I guess it's kind of a question, is it better than nothing to at right. least give them the opportunity to start on the other projects? And that's my concern, that once they start these two uh, projects and the buildings are built that what is it how, how is this going to be limiting the next purchaser or the next uh, partner and whether or not they would want to make modifications and, and also just to clarify um, the applicant uh, under the municipal code the applicant does have the right to apply for time extensions as long as the tentative map is valid. And since the state has extended, they continued to extend the life of tentative maps, um, 
this map that the applicant has is valid through, through June of 2017. So the applicant could come back year after year asking for time extensions, whether or not the council chooses to grant an extension of time for the modification to allow the phasing to remain, um, you know, that's separate from the overall shopping center request as a single phase development. Okay, just everybody uh, clear on the motion, and uh, would you please vote? And the motion carries three, uh, four, one against, and one absent. Okay, that was a public hearing, so we'll now move on to the action items. And the first one is item number four consideration of funding request by John F. Kennedy Memorial Foundation for the Ophelia Project. And this, I believe, was looked at by the members of the subcommittee for the SAF. And Ted, or you or Iris going to uh, discuss this, or is Gloria? Well, Gloria can introduce the, the Gloria. subject, and then the subcommittee can make comments if you'd like. Okay. Gloria? Okay. Mayor, City Council, the Ophelia Project has been an ongoing service provided by the John F. Kennedy Mem Memorial Foundation, and it is dedicated to mentoring girls in three unified school districts. The organization's goal is to expand the program into the new Rancho Mirage High School. They are requesting $5,000. The SA of Subcommittee is recommending an award in the amount of $1,500 from the SAF Discretionary Fund. Susan Francis from the organization is present to answer any questions. I will now turn it over to the subcommittee for comments. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, Ted or Iris, or who, who would like to speak on this item? Well, I think, I think as long as we have a representative here that um, we might want to listen to what she has to say. Okay, Welcome. Susan. Would you like to come forward? Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Francis. I am the executive director for John F. Kennedy Memorial Foundation, 73555 San Gorgonio Way in Palm Desert. And uh, I appreciate getting to address you, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to tell you that the Ophelia Project uh, is a program. It's a national model out of Erie, Pennsylvania. We've been doing it here in the desert for 16 years. Uh, in September of 2012, we expanded for the first time out of Desert Sands Unified School District into Palm Springs Unified as well as Coachella Valley Unified School Districts. And uh, we are looking to expand into the new Rancho Mirage High School. And um, so I'm here to answer any questions about the program or tell you how wonderful it is and how glad you'll be that you supported the program. Could you just briefly go through the program? Yes, um, it's a mentoring program uh, for young girls, 8th through 12th grade. And these are girls, we don't publicize this, but the girls are fed into the program by the counselors and the principals who have some knowledge of the girls' home life. And these girls are all from a high-risk home life environment. And the goal of the program is to increase GPAs and um, to help the girls reach a point of graduating from high school and go on to higher education. And how is the money spent? The money is spent uh, in uh, providing the program materials. We do significant training for the volunteers who, who bring the program to the girls, and there is some cost involved in the training. We certify all the volunteers. The girls in the program in, in the high school in Rancho Mirage are not the only recipients of the benefits of the program. The volunteers are also, many of them, uh, residents of Rancho Mirage. And they go through, like I said, a significant training program that certifies them to uh, bring the program into the schools. Right now, the training certifies them uh, with regard to the critical thinking approach to the Common Core state standards, the, the new education reform sweeping the country. 
Okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, anybody have a question of Susan? Okay. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for your consideration. Sounds like an excellent program. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll go back to the uh, subcommittee members and any comments or motion? Uh, I would make a motion that the, um, uh, the council consider funding the request by John F. Kennedy Memorial Foundation for the Ophelia Project in the amount of $1,500. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Mayor, could we take a voice vote, please? We have a malfunction. What's a voice, a voice vote? Okay. There's a malfunction. Voice vote. Iris? Yes. Ana? Yes. Mayor votes yes. Ted? Yes. 4-0 with one absent. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to the last item of the day, which is item number five, the consideration of a funding request for family art therapy at Eisenhower uh, Barbara Sinatra Children's Center. And uh, Gloria, are you going to handle this also? Yes, ma'am. Also, you might give some background as to why we're doing these uh, these applications now rather than uh, at the end of the year when we normally do it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mayor, City Council, this is a funding request uh, from the Children's Center at Eisenhower, which is expanding its garden therapy program through a family art therapy project for children who have suffered abuse, and they are requesting $5,000 for the project. The SAF subcommittee is recommending an award of $5,000 from the SAF discretionary fund. To explain the reason why we are recommending an award through the SAF discretionary fund rather than during the normal process. The normal process for SAF applications ended and we have a second account in which we fund organizations that apply after that time period has ended for a number of reasons. Um, therefore, that is why we are funding them at this time and not during the normal process. Okay, good. And the uh, recommendation is? The recommendation is to award in the amount of $5,000. And Director John Thornson was supposed to be here. I'm not sure if he is, oh, he is here to answer questions. I will now turn it over to the subcommittee. Okay. Iris? Sure. Um, I can't speak more strongly or more passionately about the issue we have in this country and worldwide about the abuse of children. And uh, there are so many organizations now that are stepping up to treat what has happened to these children and to try to change their lives and improve them. And I find it, that it's so troubling that um, so many of these abuse victims go untreated and develop abusive behaviors and end up becoming incarcerated themselves for the majority of their lives. Uh, the statistics show that a disproportionate percentage of prison inmates suffered abuse as children and did not receive services. So I think that it behooves us as a community and as a country if we treat as soon as possibly as possible that the children who have uh, become victims and if there's ways that we can do that and we can work it into our, um, our discretionary system of giving then I think it's certainly well worth it and I'm so glad that we are able to do that and I hope that everyone will vote in favor of this. Okay, thank you. Ted, did you have a comment on this? No, other than the fact that um, this particular funding uh, will serve a hundred children uh, and will be begin after the therapists receive training on December 19th. Uh, so I concur with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Smotrich that it is very worthwhile and that this is a 
you know, a need that is uh, extremely critical. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, can I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion that the City Council consider the funding request for family art therapy at Eisenhower Barbara Sinatra's Children's Center in the amount of $5,000. You want to make the request, not consider the request, right? They're not what? You want to actually make the request for funding and not consider the request for funding. That's what he meant to say. That's what he meant to say. Yeah. Did I say consider okay. or make? Okay. Language counts. Uh, is there a second, please? Second. Okay. Please vote. <clears throat> and the motion carries 4 0 with one absent. And we will be uh, recessing in the closed session. But before we do that, we'll have the city attorney, Steve Cantaneo, who has hardly said a word today. He's going to tell us what uh, the items are for closed session. Steve? It's always a good thing to have the city attorney sit quietly throughout the entire meeting. Okay. Well, you did your job. Then. Thank you. Well, the city council and the housing authority board will now recess into closed session um, to confer with this real property negotiator pursuant to government code section 54956.8 regarding property located at 42520 Bob Hope Drive. The council will also meet with its labor negotiator pursuant to government code section 54957.8 to discuss the Rancho Mirage Employees Association. The council will also meet in close, actually the Housing Authority Board will meet in closed session to confer with legal counsel regarding potential litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9. Finally, the council will meet into closed session to discuss the following pending litigation matters pursuant to government code section 54956.9. That is the case known as City of Rancho Mirage versus Spot Collective and City of, Mirage, City of Rancho Mirage versus All Valley Desert Cooperative. Thank you, Steve. And we will now recess to closed session. <laughs>